One Million Voices. Hi, I'm Katja Dopoz, and this is One Million Voices, where inspirational speakers share their stories and champion organizations that are making a difference in the world. And how do you prepare for a tour? Uh, when you have, you know, uh, you're traveling and you have all these concerts lined up one after the other, I can imagine it's very intense. I think um, uh, six or seven years ago, we were trying to, you know, we were rehearsing when we could and before we were touring an awful lot, we would just try and get it together when we could. And there was, there was no specific kind of goal. And then was it about four years ago, Simon, that we started doing our whole programs from memory, four or five years? Years yeah, ago. yeah, so three or four years ago, I think, yeah. Three or four years ago. And that was a huge step. So we do the entire, you know, a 90-minute performance, some, no longer sometimes, uh, all from memory, which is a lot. Wow. Um, and also, we, we've all got busy. We've all got older. We've all kind of got wives and families and other, other things that we need to do. So the regular rehearsals are not so easy to schedule now. Um, so in the run-up to a tour, Simon is amazing at, and I'm particularly grateful for this because I'm the least organised person in the group by a long shot. Um, he will come up with a, a really kind of definite timetable for when we have to have certain pieces memorised by. That helps me an awful lot. I still manage to get to the rehearsals and have to have my music down here. But it all, it all kind of comes comes together in the end. I know, look at his face. He's so ashamed of me. Um, but it all comes together for the tours. And But it is quite intense sometimes. The couple of days before the tours, we'll have to do a good four, um, four three-hour rehearsals just to kind of nail it all. And it, of course, it has to... The, the danger is that you, from my point of view particularly, but I think everyone to a degree, the danger is that you get this memory stuff done and you're having to focus so much on memorising the music that the kind of feel goes out of it completely and it's not free anymore. And, and so those rehearsals are generally for us to kind of really bed it in our systems so that we can we virtually don't have to think about it when we're singing it. We don't have to think about the memory side of it. So we can put more into the music. We can put more into communicating with an audience and moving around and being relaxed um, because it's no good having a group of six people just going, <laughs> it doesn't really work. Um, so yeah, the, the rehearsal periods up to the tours and the recordings can be quite intense, but still very enjoyable, you know. It, it, you can't not enjoy a rehearsal where you come in, work hard and go out thinking, oh, that's sounding really good at the end, you know, it's, it's good, it's all positive. <laughs> Any memorable concerts? Oh, many. Yeah, I think I think when we when we started going to America, I will I'll never forget our first concert in America because that's a big that's a big um, sort of part of the uh, that's that's a bit it's a big area of, of a cappella music to to sort of uh, get into. And so when when we finally started doing concerts in America, that was a that was a big deal. Um, we we sang in a, an incredible place called the Cloisters in New York City. That was that was amazing. Um, I think in recent years, I think the one that that comes back to most of us is um, so in Germany, near uh, not too far away from um, Munich, there's a place called Bayreuth, which is heavily associated with Wagner. So Va there, there's been a, a, an old Baroque opera house in Bayreuth uh, for hundreds of years, and Wagner famously loved that that place and that area. So he actually had his own opera house built there. Uh, we're obviously a six-part a cappella ensemble who don't sing opera, so we weren't singing in in the, the giant Wagner Opera House, but we were singing in the uh, in the, the old Baroque Opera House. Uh, so it's 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 quite an amazing place to go, and it, it's it's absolutely wonderful and a beautiful place, and, and a huge amount of musical history surrounding it. Uh, so that was a that was a real honour to be able to do that. Um, I can imagine the acoustics of the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we get we're very very lucky. We're, we're, if we're not singing it in, a, if we're not singing in a church with a fantastic acoustic, we're singing in a concert hall, which which is specifically designed for that kind of chamber music. And it's yeah, we, we we're very very lucky. You also, I think, in a in a group like ours, we get 
used to having to deal with the acoustics that we're given. So I remember one of our first, one of our very early concerts was we, we were flown out to Madeira um, to sing in the theatre there. And it was the first, I think it was the first time we'd sung in a theatre pretty much. And theatres are not renowned for their acoustics. And we got there and we did half of the rehearsal. We had a three hour rehearsal, we did one and a half hours. And we were all hoarse by the end of this one and a half hours because we were you know, belting it out, trying to get to the back of the theatre and it just wasn't giving us any help at all. And we had a little break in the rehearsal and a drink of water. And we just said, this is not right. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be trying to fill this place. You know, the sound that we make, those, th those six voices, the sound that we make is an, it's meant to be intimate. And we decided on that day, I remember, we decided to just sing at our normal level, if not a tiny bit quieter. And just to get, we, we, our aim was to get the audience to come into us rather than pushing our sound out to the audience. And it worked really well. I remember that night just being so pleased to look into the audience and seeing people kind of leaning in, not in a kind of, I can't hear way, but just they were drawn in. And from that day onwards, I know that whenever we go into a venue, I think you'll agree, Simon, a venue that's just not as acoustically lush as some of the others, we have to say to each other, don't over sing because that's yeah. a huge tendency. You just naturally, if something's not carrying well, you belt it out, you know, and it doesn't work. So it's, it's taught us a really good skill of being able to be more intimate and uh, people can hear. It's amazing the size of venue we can fill just singing very quietly. If, you know, mm. uh, and you get to that stage where the audience is so quiet, you could hear a pin drop and that's, that's where the magic happens. <laughs> what did she say? You often sing for the royal family. Any favorite moments? Any memorable occasions? Uh, I mean, I, yeah. I mean, just those those big big occasions. I think. I, I mean, every 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 time we get to sing for the Queen, it's that's a, that's an incredible. It's just just an incredible honor and privilege. And yeah, we kind of you, you know, as we said earlier, you, you you tend to do a lot more preparation um, for those services, but also you, you, everyone steps up in, on an occasion like that. And and everyone performs better than they usually would um, because because of the, the the privilege of the situation. Um, yeah. Go my favourite, I think my favourite bit of any royal occasions is um, whenever we sing the national anthem. This happened when I got the job here uh, 11 years ago. I don't, we've all sung the national anthem a million times, you know, but that first service where I had to sing it at the actual Queen, that was really <laughs> cool. That gave me a big buzz to think, oh, she's standing right there. And I was just, you know, we're all told to stand with our arms down by our side and just sing it straight ahead. And my eyes were just, is she enjoying it? Do you think, is she joining in? <laughs> I wondered if she's joining in. And then I saw Prince Philip standing next to her joining in. And I thought, that's really funny. That's really cute. And yeah, that was a big buzz for me. I don't know whether I'm, <laughs> I don't know why Simon's laughing at me. Is it because I'm calling Prince Philip cute? Yeah, I find that really funny. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a good moment for me. in a concert and particularly from the uh, point of view of the audience um, it can be a very emotional experience and all right I mean music can lift the spirits um, it's just you know some moments some concerts are just memorable and I remember I have seen you guys perform I have seen groups like the King's College Choir as well you know it's just beautiful and it just gives me the goosebumps you know so I just I think my question is 
you uh, as professionals, you have to be there in the moment and just stay focused. But do you also feel, you know, do you remember any concerts in particular moments that, you know, someone from the audience came over to you and just said, wow, that was just simply magical. And you also felt that way, you know, during when you were singing and you just, and you felt, you know, this is it. Mm. I remember one, con sorry, do you mind, Simon? No, no, go. Um, I remember one concert particularly, and Simon might have to help me out with the details of this, but there were three choirs. There was us, um, Hampton Court, no, not Hampton Court, a chapel royal, and one other royal peculiar chapel. And mm -hmm. we all came together. It was when Richard Pennell was acting director of music, and we did a concert of kind of coronation anthems and a bit of Walton and some huge kind of... Um, it was just music from across the ages and there were these three big royal chapels and the organ behind us because it was in the, the a different bit of the chapel so the organ was behind us blasting out and we were just seeing all this cool music with all these historic chapels and the organ blasting out and it a full audience there and that that gave me a real goosebump experience i was just so i just couldn't stop smiling and there have been quite a few occasions like that really well well either i'll either just have a fixed grin on my face because it's so cool and amazing or there's i don't know whether you have this simon ever where i get quite emotional i almost kind of well up because it's just so amazing it's either either because it's so beautiful or because it's so exciting or you know mm. so I've had usually, usually usually i get that feeling and with particular pieces of music that i love and you know it's and it sometimes it, it does become a bit overwhelming because you are you know you, you get to you get to perform this this music at the highest possible standards um of, of anywhere in, in the world and and to be a, to be a part of that with when you're singing music that you really deeply love that's 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 an incredible experience i think in the queen six it's it's i get it quite quite regularly certainly with the the, the early music with the slower maybe more contemplative um more serious side of the music uh when it's very 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 beautiful music and the, it's a big audience or, or a full venue and and um they're all just completely there listening to you and you can hear a pin drop at the very end and, yeah. and the, the, as the sound fades yeah you get goosebumps and you you just like yeah, this this couldn't be much better, really. This is this is why we do what we do, and it's why I miss it works. so much at the moment. And that works back, doesn't it, to the um, the intimacy thing as well? Because you're quite often in a situation like that that Simon just described. You'll quite often get to the end of this chord, and the applause won't start for ages, and you'll quite often hear somebody just go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a it's such a kind of yeah. It's it's it's, just, a, it's a re it's a real compliment. It feels like a real compliment when people have that reaction to our music, and it's yeah. That's that's when we think, oh, okay, maybe maybe we do know what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. So one question that we always ask our guests here at One Million Voices is: there are top tips for someone who's just starting out. So what would be your top tips, your advice uh, for someone who's uh, thinking, you know, considering becoming a professional singer and member of a choir? So, I mean, the, the, first, the first tip really is, well, there are two main tips to start with. Firstly, join a choir. Uh, there's, no, there's no better way to learn how to sing in an ensemble than by actually doing it. Um, if you also, if you're, if you're wanting to improve your own voice, you need to get lessons and you need to practice, 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 practice. That's, that's the best thing you can do. The more, the more you practice, the more you actually experience singing with a choir, the more likely you are to, to get better and better at it. And I would say as well, I mean, it depends what level you're working at, but I would say try and be aware of the notes you're singing on the page rather than just hearing them in your head. So what I'm trying to say, I guess, is learn to read music rather than just kind of winging it or f f um, learning by rote, by hearing. Um, it's a hugely important skill to being a, a good choral singer to be able to read music. Yeah. So that's another important thing. Uh, yes, I think, I think the, the, other, the, other main, the other main thing is learning to listen. Yeah, like I, I would say that maybe 60, 70 percent of singing in a choir is, is listening to what's going on around you, perhaps even more, actually. Um, and listening to what's going on around you, taking it in, reacting to what's going on around you. That's, that's a major point. So is it crucial to um, start really young um, when you are, you know, a kid or a teenager? Or is it something because you mentioned other members of the Queen Six that started um, 
later on so you know is it possible also to to start when you are more uh, mature i wouldn't say it's crucial to start young i think you can anyone anyone can come to singing at any age um absolutely uh i think i guess if you if you want to do it sort of for a career then starting early is 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 good it's probably preferable um i, I don't i'd be interested to, to know what dan would say actually maybe, maybe he would say he wished he'd started earlier maybe he wouldn't i'm, I'm not sure I think dan might say he wished he'd never started at all <laughs> maybe maybe knowing dan um yeah no I, I would say start start young yeah start young i think that's definitely going to be preferable but i think you hit a nail on the head simon i was going to say it as well when you said that um if you're intending to kind of pursue it as a career, or if that's your plan, then start young. But, you know, as Simon said earlier than that, there are choirs to join. There are not, there are amateur choirs. There are um, choirs all over the place that don't require auditioning that you can just go and sing. And, um, and I think it's really important to remember that singing is brilliant for so many things other than making music. It's brilliant for mental health. It's brilliant for um, socializing, making new friends, um, a kind of uh, what's the word endorphins it releases endorphins just like exercise does and um, so it's never you don't have to start young it's it's good to if you're going to be a professional singer but it doesn't mean as you said earlier on Simon it doesn't mean you can't approach it later um, yeah. it's always approachable <laughs> it's also good as, as a child singing in a choir it's very good for discipline that's one of the reasons I didn't enjoy it when I was a kid but it is actually a very very good thing to, to learn that the sort of discipline that, that being in a choir teaches you mm. well one thing that is um, interesting to discuss is um, obstacles and challenges I mean in all professions we we find uh, you know uh, obstacles and challenges to overcome but um, I guess you know for artists in particular, it can be um, disheartening sometimes. So what would be uh, your advice? What would you say to people who just, you know, are losing hope? I think it's very, very hard. Um, there are so many obstacles and an awful lot of the obstacles are unseen obstacles. Um, it's a bit like um, what I think we might end up talking about later, maybe, is, is the mental health thing, which is kind of hidden, but there, very really there. And I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure on singers in a performing way, but also to get the work. There's really kind of quite, there's not very much work around for an awful lot of good singers. Um, so inevitably in a business like ours where you're freelanced and generally you're not kind of, you're not kind of salaried to a choir it's not it's not like a traditional job you're just batting around from one choir to the other doing recording sessions here and there and having to top it up with teaching or another job um that can be quite soul destroying and it can really kind of knock you i think um so i would say that's one of the biggest obstacles is not knowing where your next bit of money is coming from. And it's not always the case, you know, when you get to a certain stage, you, you can rely on it a bit more, but even then, especially as a vocalist, you never know when you're going to wake up one morning and possibly go, it's, it's no longer. And because of the intensity of the training from the age of six, when you become a chorister, inevitably other things go by the wayside. So you have to fully throw yourself into being a singer and being a musician and then heaven forbid if that ever stops i mean if my voice gave up tomorrow i wouldn't know what the heck i was going to do for the rest of my life because <laughs> i haven't I, don't, I haven't been trained in anything else and and it's not as simple as doing a three or four year degree in your chosen field of work where you're going to work for the rest of your life it's an ongoing and constant thing um whereby you know you might do a concert one day which has a three-hour rehearsal and get a pretty decent fee for it but it pre pretty decent bit of money and then actually in the cold light of day you think well hold on a minute I practiced for so many hours a day I've prepared this music for countless hours before I got to the rehearsal on the day of the concert and you normally have to travel about eight million miles to get to, get to your concert so it's there are challenges but I've been a bit negative there but overall the joy of it all overcomes the 
the challenges, I think. But it, yeah, Simon, go on with some obstacles before I get to... Well, I know, I was, I was just going to say that, as Tim says, there are a number of obstacles that, that you might hit. And one of them that he touched upon is, is the idea of, of, of getting vocal issues. You know, we know a number of singers who have had vocal issues. And I think it's very important to keep having singing lessons. It doesn't matter how, doesn't matter how professional a singer you are, how successful a singer you are, how famous a singer you are. Everyone needs to have, have singing lessons because they, that's, your, your vocal health is very important. We spoke about it earlier when we were talking about, you know, how have we stayed healthy during lockdown? And we spoke about vocal health a bit there. It's, it's really important to keep using your voice uh, and to keep having lessons, keep, keep getting second opinions as much as you possibly can. But I think that the other thing I'd say is that there are obstacles. There are some terrible obstacles. You know, if you, if you lose your voice for whatever reason, that's, that's terrible. But I think probably to know that pretty much everyone has gone through something like that and you almost always come out of the other side. It's a very, very rare occasion that someone will lose their voice and it doesn't come back. So, you know, sort of try, try, and, try and dust yourself off, get up and keep going. You That's know? it, isn't it? The, the, the determination to do it. If you haven't got the fire for it, then, well, you need to get it. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, athletes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Elite athletes, thank you. <laughs> it would be very similar, right? Well, there are, there are. In the preparation side of things and the training side of things, there certainly are. I think that's where the similarities end. But yeah, we're vocal athletes. As you know, here at One Million Voices, we always ask our guests to nominate an organization that is making a difference in the world. So Simon and Tim, could you talk to us about the organization that you have selected for us here today? Yeah, so Simon and I got together yesterday and had a little chat about this and, um, and he said, have you got any thoughts? Because we've got several charities and um, good causes that we feel very strongly about. Um, but uh, Simon agreed um, that perhaps we would go with mine this time. And um, my, my good cause is a charity called Mind, um, which is all about mental health. I'm sure you've heard of them. And as someone who not only has mental health issues within his family, um, I've suffered all my life with mental health issues and a series of um, dependency and addiction issues, um, of which thankfully I'm now clear 11 months yesterday. Um, Congratulations. So thank you, yeah. Um, and I think that Mind is such a, a fantastic charity and I think it ties in nicely with the work that we're doing as well. I'm sure all the guys would agree that, um, that actually in the music business, just like what we were talking about earlier, um, there are obstacles and some of those obstacles are quite hidden. And I would say one of the biggest obstacles is that you're quite alone as a musician. Um, there's not that sense of kind of being in an office with a load of people around you or, you know, it can be qu quite a lonely job, not least because a lot of other people don't know an awful lot about what you do and you're having to deal with it on your own. And I think um, that, there couldn't be a better time to kind of fly the flag of mental health issues than right now when um, lockdown has had a very clear and quite devastating effect on a lot of people's mental health. And I think that's uh, particularly prevalent in the musical world. Um, and in fact, the creative arts um, in general. Um, because of course all this stuff has just stopped and we've and and a lot of us an awful lot of singers we know have unfortunately also managed uh, not managed to get any government help um they, i think the government have been a little bit clever with their um freelance financial help which means that if you don't tick absolutely the right boxes you get nothing um and of course we don't we we particularly are lucky enough to have a small salary here and a house so we're okay but I think that um that alongside I think Brexit for people who didn't vote for Bre Brexit it was a very very tricky start to the year um and I think just in general what, what mine tries to do is it tries to smash that taboo that has always been around over talking about mental health issues and being open about them which of course automatically helps your mental health issue if you're talking to people about it. Um, and they're being smashed all the time, those taboos, but mind is doing, you know, going one step further as much as it can all the time. It tries to make sure um, that there is always provision for 
people with any kind of mental health issue to to have a phone line or a text service or something you know some lifeline that they can contact um at any time of day or night and that i think to me that is so so important and i think that the world is a busy place so i mind for me is is our well for us is our chosen cause for for this interview um it's very close to all of our hearts um we've all known several people with severe mental health issues they do an incredible job mind is indeed a fantastic charity um and thank you so much tim for for sharing your story with us and for talking about this and we can see that it's coming from your heart thank you but I think we are, I mean, we are seeing progress, right? I mean, I, I think things are changing because there's still, unfortunately, um, a lot of stigma around, particular, particularly around men. Um, there is a stigma that men shouldn't be talking about, you know, their feelings, about their emotions, um, about mental health issues. And we see campaigns like, you know, the Heads Together campaign that is doing an amazing job, you know, where, you know, Prince William is talking to athletes, he's talking to footballers, and, you know, he's trying to, to raise awareness. And I think that's so important because uh, we are seeing, things are changing, we are seeing progress, but there's still a lot of, you know, like I said, stigma around it, and and but you know things are reassuring, and in the sense at least that we we are seeing more and more people talking about this. Because otherwise, how can we help each other if we're not able to express our feelings and share experiences as well? Yeah, absolutely right. And I, I think that um, well, you've hit the nail on the head. Yeah, in, in many ways. Um, and for for men to be kind of given that it's okay to cry. It's okay to not be this kind of rock that will hold everything up, come what may and be there. And it's, it's, it's not, it's not all right to expect that of people um, if they can't do it. And people should be allowed to say, I can't handle this and, and have someone there to help them. So yeah. And we were talking yesterday with Simon, weren't we about the Prince William thing yeah. as well. And I, I did a bit of research on that last night. It sounds, you know, it looks incredible and mind is a part of that heads together um so many great charities doing work and the outreach that they're putting together to get out into the community and people who might not normally um get the opportunity to um to have this kind of openness and this honesty and this realization that um that there are people in the public eye celebrities in the public eye who are holding up their hands and say yep i've been an absolute mess and every day after i got back from work on the telly or whatever when i was made up and happy as anything i would cry every night you know it's great for people to hear that and so the exposure everything is about exposure in this and and people being honest and people coming forward um in positions of responsibility and holding their hands up to it and getting rid of the stigma, yeah. So you you already explained what Mind does, uh, but tell us a little bit more about the the types of services uh, they provide, the type of assistance they provide. So I think the biggest thing it seems to do to me is is to, as I said earlier, is just to open the channels of communication and to make sure that anyone anyone anywhere who is feeling down or depressed or anxious or stressed or suicidal or what you know whichever other word can be linked with anything that's not right has got access to a number to call or a text service or something that they can contact with someone on the other end of the line who has either experienced it or, or who is very experienced about it who's able to say to them it's okay to feel like this you know it's 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 about as far as i can see the biggest thing about mine and the thing i love most about mind is that it's making um uh, as you say, it's reducing, the, get, getting rid of the stigma and it's smashing the taboos around mental health. Um, and it's making it accessible to anyone who has these issues. And they're huge. They're all over the place. And I, I can't, it, you know, when I think about it too hard, I get very stressed and upset about it because I think that there are an awful, awful number of people who don't admit, won't admit that they are struggling and they probably never will. And that's, that makes me really sad. And I think that m the, the more we can do as, as humans to encourage people, to ask people if they're okay and wait for an answer instead of this kind of, you're right, yeah, I'm all right. And then walking off, you know, um, ask someone if they're all right and then listen. And I think it's all about the listening, about the 
giving people time to say what they're feeling rather than, oh, I feel a bit sad. Oh, well, you'll be all right. Off you go. <laughs> you know, so I think that's, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to make it normal. And it is. And it's getting more and more normal because it's more and more of a problem, I think, you know. So how can we help and support this wonderful organization? Okay, so there are a number of ways you can support the charity. If you um, visit mind.org.uk, um, that's their main website. And under the getting involved um, section, it's a, it's a really easy to navigate website, thankfully. I can't bear websites that aren't. Um, you can uh, donate or fundraise. Um, there are ideas of virtual fundraising ideas within that. Um, you can take on an active challenge. So I'd imagine, you know, there's a lot of... Um, people walking Land's End to John O'Groats virtually, um, and uh, especially at the moment, of course, because you can't get out and do that. Um, and you can also donate. Um, uh, you can donate in, in memory of a, a friend or a family member who has struggled over the years. Um, and of course, as with all these charities, you can become a regular donor or, um, or a part of the charity itself. Um, I, I dare say there are ways, and I'm actually thinking about this at the moment in my own life, um, I dare say there are ways to become uh, someone on the end of a phone, you know, get some training and become someone on the end of the phone um, to help. I mean, that's, that's the ultimate help for a charity like this, isn't it? That you're actually on the, on the front line of it. Um, but the most important thing is to go to mind.org.uk and visit their website, have a good look around, see what's going on, um, and just have a think about who in your life is is or could potentially under the radar be suffering with these things uh, these horrible illnesses and uh, see if you can get involved in some way it doesn't it doesn't have to be giving money you can you can help in other ways as well thank you tim thank you for sharing this information and also uh, how can people get in touch with the Queen's Six, with you guys? So you can contact us through our website, which is www.thequeensix.com. Um, if you just type the Queen's Six into Google, we should be the first thing that comes up. And there's a, there's a contact us page on the website. You can send us an email. You can uh, get in touch with us on Facebook. You can, I think my phone number's even on there. You can, you can send, me a, send me a text, you know, give me, give me a rude phone call or something, whatever you like. Isn't she Thank you so much, guys. This has been a real treat, a wonderful interview. I'm sure people will enjoy watching this. And thank you for taking the time, you know, for talking to us here today, for sharing your knowledge, for sharing your stories, your experience, and for talking to us about MIND, this great organization. You know, and it was, it was just a pleasure to see you and to talk to you. And I hope next time, you know, we, that we see each other, we'll be, you know, with you guys on stage singing and I will be in the audience. <laughs> Thank you so much. That would be very nice. Thank you so much for having us, Katia. It's been fascinating to talk to you and, and lovely to see you and love to see my little friend, Simon, who actually is only how many meters or feet? I don't know, about 250 feet away from each other, probably. Yeah, I reckon if yeah. I shouted really loudly out my window, Simon could help hear me through his. But no, um, Knowing how loudly you can shout, I know that that is true. But I'm not yeah. going to do that because my vocal health is all important. Sure. Catchy, thank you so much for having us. It's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> watching this interview, don't forget to like, leave your comments, share the link and subscribe to the channel. You can also follow us on social media. This is a very exciting moment for the One Million Voices project as we are just starting out. So I invite everyone to join us. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time. <laughs>